I really love being stuck in traffic. <laughs> it's not something that you're likely to hear from anyone. The truth is that it doesn't matter how used we are to being stuck in traffic, it affects our lives. It takes away valuable time that we could be using with our families, with our friends, or for ourselves. But I'm not here to talk about traffic jams today. I'm here to talk about how driverless cars could help tackle the problem of congestion. And more specifically, the key ingredient that will really transform our lives with those autonomous machines. Over the past couple of years, I've been involved in the research and trials of connected and autonomous vehicle technologies, primarily around what kind of infrastructure our roads need in order to support driverless cars. Now, you need to know why I'm using the terms autonomous and driverless separately here. So an autonomous car is a car that has autonomous features. And those levels of autonomy may vary. They might be basic autonomy, think GPS, um, park assist, cruise control. Or they might be advanced autonomy, think um, autopilot. So you're driving your car, you press the button, you let the steering wheel, and then the car drives by itself up until the point that you need to ha hand over control again to you. Now, a driverless car, as the name suggests, doesn't need a driver. Apart from setting its destination, the car can start itself, drive itself, and park, all without human intervention. So a driverless car is an autonomous car with those advanced levels of autonomy. But an autonomous car might not necessarily be driverless. It might still need that person there pressing the button, enabling cruise control, and so on. And today, I'm going to talk about something that's actually going to be common to both. But before I get there, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the driverless side of things. So according to Innovate UK, 39% of us today would be willing to use a driverless car for commute. Now, the likelihood is that that number will increase with time. And the question is obviously, how could that shift in behavior help tackle congestion? And the answer is actually quite simple, and it's through connectivity. Both autonomous and driverless cars are being developed to talk to each other using something that's called vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications, or V2V. So the idea is that each car will be equipped with its own special type of Wi-Fi called 802.11p. So the car will have its own local private network around itself that will allow the car to exchange messages to the cars nearby. And those messages, they could be related to the car's location, their presence, could be related to the speed that they're going at, could even be related to the car and the fruit is, is braking. And those messages will be really helpful with tackling congestion. And I'll explain why. If you think of the road network today, we've got different types of cars. And we've got people driving out there with different gaps between each other, different speeds. So if the cars are talking to each other, they are able to agree on a common speed and a common distance, which means that the traffic flows better, you free up space, and you help tackle congestion. Now, one of the trials I've been involved with is in Newcastle. So the idea there is we wanted to take that concept of V2V one step further. So we wanted to, um, as well as getting the cars talking to each other, we wanted to get the cars talking to the traffic signals. So we equipped 12 non-emergency NHS ambulances with some 802.11p kit. We also equipped 20 intersections, 20 sets of traffic signals. So it's quite simple. You have the driver. As the ambulance is approaching the junction, the ambulance requests priority. It requests for the lights to change to green as quickly as possible. So if the lights are red, the driver gets a countdown in seconds as to how long it will take for those lights to change to green. But if the lights are already green, then the driver will get something like this, which is effectively a confirmation that that priority has been granted and that that green light will be extended so that he or she can traverse that intersection safely. So with all of that information flowing from the car and from the um, traffic signals back and forth, our team developed a new feature. So the idea was to give information to the driver as to what optimal speed he or she should be going at in order to meet those green lights efficiently. And we found that actually developing that feature had a huge impact. We found that on average, each driver was saving about 20% CO2 emissions just by having more information in the car, 
just by having the sort of, you should slow down two miles an hour, it should reduce your speed by three miles an hour, it should increase your speed by three miles an hour, obviously taking into account the road speeds. All of that meant that the drivers could al avoid the unnecessary braking and accelerating, created a smoother journey. Simple, through connectivity. So yes, connectivity is really useful, and sh we showed in here that it had some benefits that we didn't think we would see at the beginning of the project. And I'll give you another example where connectivity can be helpful. Something that most of us here are probably familiar with, and most of you probably hated as well. And that's looking for parking. Now, even if you're the Dalai Lama, you probably hate the idea of looking for parking. It's painful, right? But in, on average, the UK driver spends 2,549 hours looking for parking. No, seriously. <laughs> that's over 106 days, equivalent to 17 round trips to the moon. I don't know you, I would rather be napping rather than looking for parking. <laughs> but um, it's, a long, it's a long time that we spend out there just driving around. And the way some cities like London have done to actually solve the problem, solve the congestion that is caused by those drivers uh, driving around looking for parking, is by installing road sensors. So the sensors can tell whether the parking space is occupied or whether the parking space is, fr is um, free. And then if you have a, a mobile phone, you can download the app, you can set up where you're going, and as you get nearer your destination, it shows the nearest available parking space, and it takes you automatically there. So you don't have to drive around looking for parking. So yes, connectivity is great, and it really helps traffic networks, whether it's with the parking problem or with the um, ambulance scenario. But there is a much more important element behind it all, something that's often overlooked. And that element is information. Information about how long the lights will take to change. Information about where the parking spaces are. Without that information, a car will still be stuck in traffic, will still be driving around looking for parking, whether you have a driver in the car or whether you don't. But with information, the car can plan its journey efficiently and safely. Even if it doesn't have connectivity, the car can still make its own educated guesses, if you like. But I guess the other the question would be, OK, if driverless cars need all of that information, wh where is it going to get it from? Now, if you're thinking of planned roadworks, um, events, congestion spots, accidents, all of that information actually already exists. And local and city and rural authorities will have that that's being generated from road sensors or it's being created by the authorities and maintained in databases. The road sensors in particular are really interesting because they're often invisible to us, and they're everywhere. Most cities and towns out there will have them. I'll give you an example. This is Worcester Street in Oxford. Now raise your hand if you can actually clearly see where the sensors are in this picture. Can anyone? I see no hand. I'm gonna zoom in. Is this better? And I'm, I'm not intending to be an eye test in here, this or the other. Anyone? I see one hand. Maybe. No, no, not anymore. Okay, so the sensors here, here they are. So those dark gray lines there on the floor, they're inductive loops. You might see them in different shapes. Sometimes they are squares, sometimes they are um, rectangles. They actually have magnets inside them that induce electric current from nearby wires to detect vehicles. And then on the top, you've got overhead radar sensors that can detect whether people are crossing the road or whether they're waiting to cross. So these sensors are providing already a very rich amount of data that local authorities are already making use of. So in addition to that, we also have connected devices. Devices that we carry in our pockets, think of mobile phones. The, connect the devices that we have in our cars, sat-navs, um, infotainment systems. Those devices have GPS that can track where we are and sometimes can track where we're going. And with connected vehicles growing, we'll see more and more data, and the likelihood is we'll see better improved services as well. Think of your sat-nav. If the sat-nav had information about the, ro the road conditions in more detail, if you knew when the accidents happened straight away, if you knew where the congestion spots are straight away, we would be able to estimate accurately our time of arrival. 
So you don't have to leave home early just in case you hit traffic anymore. You would make your estimated time every time. I'll give another example where information can be useful. Imagine you're going home after a long day, you're driving, and you take the motorway. And then you see this. M3 closed, junction three to junction five. If you know where those junctions are, you don't have a problem, you know straight away that that's whether that's gonna affect you or whether you need to do something about it or whether you can just relax and you know, carry on. But if, like me, you drive the same roads every day, you still haven't been able to, rec to memorize any of the junction numbers. <laughs> Seriously, cannot tell any of them. You'll probably be wondering, well, does this affect me? I don't know, maybe I'll carry on and hope for the best or maybe I'll divert before that and maybe that wasn't necessary. If only our cars could take that information and show it to us if it's relevant. If it affects our journey, then it can be displayed. If it doesn't, why bother? So there are lots of examples where information can be really powerful and can really help our journeys. But in a world where surveillance is everywhere, are we happy to share our location in the hope to improve our journeys? Well, the answer to that at the moment is maybe. 57% of us would be willing to share our data as long as we had more uh, personalized and better services in return. But then I guess the question would be, with, with driverless cars coming, should we bypass the fundamental right of privacy in the exchange of improved congestion, better, better commuting? Well, one thing you need to know is that in January 2016, the European Commission defined that vehicle information, such as speed and location, will be treated as personal data. And we've seen the same trend in other governments as well. They're following the same pattern of treating vehicle information as personal data. Which means that vehicle manufacturers and service providers will be able to process that data as long as they have the individual's consent, which leaves up to us as to whether we want to try it or whether we want to opt out. And having the opportunity to opt out is extremely important because not all of us are comfortable sharing our location. Not all of us are comfortable handing over control to machines. Maybe we don't trust them. Maybe we think that they will make judgment calls that are different from ours. Or maybe it's simply because we think that they will get hacked. But if you're willing to embrace it, there are so many doors that the concept of connected and autonomous vehicles can open. There are so many things that the overlooked secret information out there can change. From more relevant guidance to us, all the way to full autonomous transport to areas where the options are currently limited. Well, if you're going to try it, or if you're going to opt out, I think we can all agree that the future is really exciting. And I really cannot wait for us all to be part of it. Thank you.